Guess it's time to get started due to the people sort of trickle in. Maybe people have decided not to brave this cold. In any event, we've got, uh, we only have one thing scheduled for this week, integration by par. So we might end up using Thursday as a review day. If people have questions, we'll um, see what happens. Chapter eight, that's where we are now. We're in 8.2. 8.1 is kind of just a review section. We've never covered that. So chapter eight is integration techniques. And we already know N integration technique, which is U substitution. I mean, that's the stuff we were doing last week with the inverse trig functions. I wouldn't call that a technique per se, I just call it learning some new integrals and then using that. So integration techniques are, well, sort of what they sound like. You have an integral, you want to take it, you don't know how, it's not an antiderivative that you have memorized, so you use some trick and there are really three, three integration techniques I think that we want to cover. And two of them will be a little brief. I'm not, I'm not the world's biggest fan of all of this manual integration. I think that's what technology is for. But integration by parts is kind of important. I'll even uh, say that it's really important. We, um, it shows up a lot in applications having to do with periodic functions. So it shows up a lot in applications having to do with the sine and the cosine, and also e to the x, which you might think isn't periodic, but if you look at it on the convex plane, it turns out that it also has periodic properties. So integration by parts. Is a technique for, and just like, U substitution. There's no one size fits all integration method, but integration by parts is a technique worth some time, is it? Integrating product. And we need, we don't have, I mean, in general, integrating products in R, right? Because it's not true in general that the antiderivative, I mean, it's not true ever that the product, that the antiderivative of a product is the product of the antiderivative. It's like if you're given X, times the cosine of x dx. This is the product of two functions. It's the product of the x and it's the product of the cosine, but we're entirely helpless to integrate that product, at least at the moment. Even though we know how to integrate x, even though we know how to integrate the cosine, once we multiply them together, there's nothing we can do. 
So integration by parts is a technique that sometimes lets us integrate products. It lets us integrate to this, for example. And when we write the integration by parts form to the, on the whiteboard, it's probably going to look like gibberish, but we'll do examples that will maybe, you know, verify things. But the integration by parts form to the is U D V equals u v minus the integral of v du. I do not know why the integration by parts form to the is given in terms of u's and v's. That's the only time we have functions named u and v in couch to this, but it is an ancient tradition. It must be at least a century old by now. What's this saying? Oh, that's the hard part. Um, or I won't say hard, but the trickier part. So we break this product into two pieces. We're calling one of these pieces U, and we're calling the other piece DV. And then over here, we have DU, and we have V. So the U and the DV have turned into a V and a DU. And the relationship between these is, is that the V is the integral of DV. And DU is the derivative of U. And this is still, still probably looks uh, like very little. We need to do an example. We need to just kind of dive in and pick this with Let's use the, let's use this problem, the integral I said, well, it's a product. So even though we can deal with X and the cosine, we, um, we can't deal with their product. Let's say X times the cosine of X the cosine of x dx. So integration by parts says that if you have a product, you need to split it into two parts. One of those parts we should call u, and the other part we should call dv. And this can be a tricky step because you know there might there there's more than one way maybe to do that, and maybe one way works and another way doesn't. But for my first example. Let's call this part of the product D of V and this part of the product U. So we've got a U and we've got a D of V. 
And to use integration by parts, we start with U and we start with DV and we end up with, with a V and a DU. So integration by parts involves kind of fitting in a char. Let me, let me get, put a little more space between these terms. So there is our U and there is our D V. And D U is the derivative of U, the derivative of X is one. If you want to, you know, if you want to make this very formal looking, you can say that du is one dx, just like when we were doing u substitution. But du is the derivative of u. That's the significant part. And v is the integral of d v and at this point there's always the possible i'm just ignore there's a constant of integration just ignore that at this point it's always possible that integration by parts will come to a screeching halt because if you've selected as your DV something that you don't know how to integrate, you're not going to be able to find your V. So integration by part, I said that it's a trick for products and it really requires that our products, the terms in our product not be too complicated. We need nice terms that we can integrate without too much hassle. And this X, which we can differentiate without too much hassle. So integration by parts doesn't work well with super complicated products. But once we've found U and DU and DV and V, then integration by parts becomes a bug and play process with the integration by parts formed of the up here. We want this integral. Well, the first term in this formula is u times v. So we want to take u, u is x, and we want to take v. We found we found V down here, V is the side of X. So that's U times V minus the integral of V. So V appears twice in the integration by parts formed of a. V is the sine of X. V du, du is one. If you write the dx, then it ends up looking a little nicer, but the, the thing that really matters here is that one times the sine of x is the sine of x, and we can integrate the sine of x.
In particular, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine of x. So the derivative of the negative cosine is the positive sine of x. And we wind up with x times the sine of x plus the cosine of x. And now here, I'll go ahead and throw in my constant of integration. That's integration by parts. I always sort of enjoy, maybe enjoy is strong, but um, I, often, I find that compared to the problems we were just looking at, where you've got these ugly square roots and you're trying to pull stuff out and make it look like an inverse trig function, I find these relatively straight forward at least. I think most students ultimately can do this material a lot easier than they can do last week's material. But integration by parts does have its difficulties. Um, to do integration by parts, you have this product you select a u and you select a d of v. I mean, that's sort of, that's how this process begins. Even if integration by parts works, um, that's a choice you have to make and it's possible to make the wrong choice. Like let's say, let's keep x times the cosine of x. Let's see, do not want to erase this. And let's say we say, okay, we have this product. Let's do integration by parts. Um D of V needs to be something we can integrate. Well, we can integrate X. The integral of X is one half X squared. That's easy. So we'll let X be a D of V. And let me not try to color code this one. If X is D of V, that leaves the cosine of X to be a U. And now we can use, or we can try to use integration by parts. V is the integral of D V. So one half X squared. I never, never leave myself enough room to work with these problems. If X is D V, then V is the integral of that, one half X squared. If U is the cosine of X, then D U is the derivative of that. Negative the sine of X. And from a math, sort of formal mathematical point of view, we haven't done anything wrong here. If we select this as our dv and this is as our u, then we found v correctly. We found du correctly. And the integration by parts form of the will be a true state. And the integration by parts form to the says, okay, you need to take U 
and you need to take V, and you need to multiply them together. One half times X squared times the cosine of X minus, and now we have to have a V du. So there's a V still circled. du is the negative sign of X. So negative one half X squared times the sine of X dx. And great. I mean, from a, as I say, I mean, this is a, this is true. It's not like the integration by parts formed of the has just given us a flatly wrong statement. But the integration by parts formed of the replaces an integral with another integral. It really only works if we can take this new integral we get. And if we don't know how to integrate x times the cosine of x, we certainly don't know how to integrate one half x squared times the sine of x. If anything, this attempt at integration by part has made our problem worse instead of better. So, even if integration by parts works, like integration by parts is the correct choice for this integral, you then have to make other choices. You have to select U, you have to select D of E. And if you do that wrong, integration by parts might end up not being helpful. So integration by parts, once you've decided to use integration by parts, and that is also a choice, but integration by parts requires you to make a choice. You've got a product You need to decide what you should be. Once you've decided what you is, DV will just be everything that's left. So we only have to make this one choice. And there's an acronym people use. I feel like this is kind of new. I don't think I don't think this was a thing when I was an undergraduate, but the sort of been totally thinking on a word here, the sort of memory aid that gets taught nowadays is a lion. And each of these letters stands for a type of function. L stands for log. I stands for inverse trig. A stands for algebraic, so stuff like x and x squared. P stands for trig, and E stands for exponential. 
So this is a guideline, first of all. It's something some dude came up with. There's no absolute guarantee that it will always work. But the idea is that you just go down the list. And you should be the first of these functions that appears on the list. To clarify that, we had x times, what, was it the cosine of x? Well, x is an algebraic function. The cosine of x is a trig function. So we go down this list, no logarithms, no inverse trig functions, but we do have an algebraic function. U is algebraic. So the first of those letters we see, the first type of function that appears on the list, is the algebraic, and we let that algebraic function be u. And the trig function, which appears further to the right on the list, therefore ends up being dv. What's the rationale for this list? Um, the rationale for this list is that we're going to take the derivative of u. We're going to take du. And the derivative of u is going to show up in an integral. And we're going to need to take this integral. So basically what we have here is an ordered list of how simple differentiation makes the function. Um, so a logarithm. That's a super complicated function. The last thing we teach in college algebra, it's defined in this unintuitive way. Um, so the logarithm is complicated. On the other hand, the derivative of the logarithm one over X, that's a pretty simple function. So if we can let you would be the logarithm, then when we take the derivative, when we go from u to du, we can replace a really complicated function with a simpler function. times the natural logarithm of x dx. This is a product that's at least a candidate for integration by parts. And it's the product of an algebraic function with a logarithmic function. Well, in Lyot, L comes before A. So we'll let U be the logarithm. And that leaves X to be a DV. If we use integration by parts, we 
Well, du, the derivative of the logarithm, is one over x. V, the integral of x, sorry, I know I'm kind of crowded in here, but V is the integral of x, it's one half x squared. Let me box this. And now the integration by parts formed of a actually didn't want to erase that line. The integration by parts formed of a says u of e. So one half x squared times the natural log of x. This is u of e minus the integral of v du, one half x squared times one over x dx. And you see something good has happened. We've replaced that logarithm. The logarithm is complicated. In fact, we don't even know how to integrate the logarithm at this point. That's not an integral we've learned yet, but we've replaced it with this, which might look ugly, but this one over X is just going to cancel one of these X's. And it's actually really nice. It's just one half X. So one half X squared times the natural log of X minus one fourth X squared plus a constant of integration. So we let u be the logarithm because the logarithm simplifies the most when you replace it with its derivative. One over x, very, um, the logarithm of x, very complicated. One over x, very simple. And it sort of works that way down the line. The inverse trig functions, you know, I would hesitate to call one divided by one plus x squared a simple function, but it's certainly nicer than the arc tangent. So you take the derivative of an inverse trig function, it becomes a simple. So it's a good choice for you. Algebraic functions are kind of a middle choice. It doesn't, it's not always going to work. Like the square root is algebraic. And the derivative of the square root still has a square root in it. Differentiating that algebraic function doesn't really simplify it. On the other hand, if we have a polynomial, if we have an x squared, say, the derivative of x squared is 2x, we go from a second degree polynomial to a first degree polynomial. So differentiating algebraic functions sometimes simplifies them. So it's a made thing a choice for you. Trig functions are usually a pretty poor choice for you because trig functions don't become simpler when you differentiate them. Like the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. And 
if we don't know how to differentiate, how to integrate the tangent, well, I mean, the secant squared is not simpler than the tangent. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. The cosine is not simpler than the sine. And then the absolute worst choice for you, well, the exponential function literally doesn't change when you differentiate it. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So this is sort of an ordered list from best to worst in terms of how much simpler DU will be to work with compared to you. And that's the rationale behind the Other things to, I mean, I have a lot of things to say about integration by parts. We're not going to finish it today. I guess maybe at the risk of, you know, being negative, we should recognize right away that integration by parts isn't always going to work. I mean, integration by parts, is a trick for integrating a product, but it's not some magic one size fits all. We'll deal with every product this way technique. It's an, it's an unfortunate truth. How to this too doesn't count techniques like that. It was only in calculus one where we'd learn a product rule and then we could differentiate all products. Integration is pickier. So I mean something like the integral of the square root of x time is a the secant of x. This is a product. I mean, it's not, it's not irrational to try integration by parts here, but at least at the moment, we are going to have no idea how to do this problem if we actually try this. Um, why is the square root of x? Well, because the square root of x is algebraic um, compared to the secant, which is trigonometric. So I'm following like it here, a before t. And du is then one over two times the square root of x. And the problem is going to show up right away. If we let u be the square root of x, that leaves the secant to be dv. That makes v the integral of the secant. But just like we don't know at this point the integral of the natural logarithm, we don't know the integral of the secant. So at this point, I mean, our effort kind of comes grinding to a halt. We can't find V, we can't do integration by parts. Or, I mean, I guess we could say, well, diet is just a rule of thumb. Maybe we should try that in U be the secret. Maybe integration by parts works great here. We just chose the wrong U. 
but I mean, you can probably guess from my tone of voice, I'm not super optimistic that changing our choice of you will fix things here. If we let you be the secant of X, then DU is the secant times the tangent. That leaves DV to be the square root of X and I guess the good news is that we can at least five V. So integration by parts hasn't let us down just yet. But when we put these together, it's, it's not going to work out. U times V is so two thirds times the secant of X times X to the three halves. Ooh, that's ugly notation. Let's put in some parentheses. Minus the integral of two thirds X to the three halves times the secant of X times the tangent of X. And integration by parts took a little longer to let us down with this choice of U and this choice of DV, but it still doesn't work. I mean, we still end up with an integral that we can't take. So again, no one size fits all techniques in calculus too. One over X times the sine of one over X BX. This is just the next example that pops into my head of a function whose integral we cannot take using integration by parts, even though it's a product. And I mean, it's going to be exactly the same issue that we had here. If we follow Lyot, you should be one over X. DV should be the sine of one over X. And then we can't find V. What's the integral of the sine of one over X? We don't know, right? Um, because this is a composition. I mean, we've got an outside function and an inside function. The only way we could find V, the only way we could integrate this is to try a little, let's say W substitution, because we're already using U for something else. But if we let, W would be the inside function. DW is negative one over X squared. We don't have a negative one over X squared. So everything kind of collapses. U substitution doesn't let us find V. If we can't find V, then the integration by parts has failed. On, on the other hand, I mean, again, this is all kind of, this is what sort of, I think, makes out to this to 
tricky for people, aside from the algebra. If we modified this example just a little, if we made that one over x squared, we could take this integral, but not using integration by parts. If we had one over x squared, we could take this integral as an exercise in U substitution. So it's difficult. I mean, there's no way around it. You have a product, maybe you can use U substitution, maybe you can use parts, maybe we haven't learned any technique. That I mean, obviously on quizzes and stuff, I'm not going to give you integrals you can't take, but out in the wild, maybe it's parts, maybe it's you substitution, maybe you're just not going to be able to take the integral. And you really have to be willing to just experiment. Try something, if it doesn't work, Try something else. So maybe you don't immediately think of um, substitution here. Maybe you go ahead and try integration by parts. You will get this far. in your integration by parts, you realize that you can't go any further because you can't integrate that and find V. So, okay, that didn't work. What do we do? Do we keep with integration by parts? Maybe we should try letting U would be the sign of one over X. But no, that's not going to work either. Maybe integration by parts just isn't the method we should be using here. There's definitely a lot of that in calculus too. I think that's why students find this harder than calculus one, because calculus one is very much, you see a product, use the product. Rule. You see a quotient, use the quotient rule. You see a composition, use the chain rule. And we really don't have that in calculus too. Kind of a down note, but we'll end class here. I see. Now let me 